every part of the manuscript is a living thing. The wood had to be cut. The animal had to be slaughtered. So these are all living things coming together to make the book. One thing that, as a librarian, I'm always wary of is the, the way I handle these manuscripts. As an Ethiopian, I see how these books are revered. It makes me stop and realize, oh, I'm not holding just a book, but I'm holding something that's spiritually significant. When you are in diaspora, you do not have the chance to learn about your history, especially as someone who's an African. Um, you know, it's not on TV, it's not on a popular magazine. For somebody who is, say, born here in Canada and they grew up as a young, you know, young Ethiopian, it's important for them to connect to these books by physically encountering these objects. And when we physically encounter Ethiopian manuscripts, all your sensory comes alive. The physical heaviness of the book, the thickness of it, the smell of the book, because they're parchment, they retain the smell. So when you physically encounter the book, it does invoke all of these senses. You automatically connect to something that's living. There is a traditional position within the church, Akabi, Akabi Mas'af, the protector of the book or keeper of the book, and their role specifically would be to look after the book. There are ways of handling certain books, and uh, of course, placing them is, is really important. Um, you would not place a manuscript on the floor. That's one, because it's, it's considered disrespectful. And secondly, you would not touch a manuscript if a priest is next to you without their kind permission. Sometimes you cannot even place a water next to, um, for example, in the case of amulet scrolls. Um, because it's considered it will kill it, the, the potency of, uh, of the text. So in this clam shell, we have a 19th century uh, book, hymn book called De Gua, and it's kept in this leather case to protect it. Looking at how fragile this manuscript is, it must have been constantly used and it has been sold quite a few times. So this manuscript would have been owned by priests, monks within the church who would, um, who would probably learning to, 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 to recite the hymns. And as you can see from the stitching and how they've put together the manuscript, they've made their own uh, conservation treatment, one could say, uh, you know, therefore preserving it. It's still usable, it's still robust, the first thing you noticed is that um, the wooden board here has cracked. This is quite common with these heavy wooden boards of this period. And it is a traditional way of preserving the book. And possibly they would have probably got the strings from the scribes, this, the priests. You could see that one of the difficulties with the Ethiopian manuscript, what makes them unique and also difficult, is that you could always take the strings out and add another Manuscript. So sometimes you have layers of manuscripts of different period. Okay, here we have a personal psalter has been rebound by the owner, where he's made some of his own uh, folk men here, where he's trying to keep it intact. And some of the actual care to protect the book is after the, when the binding was coming undone, he's added this probably later, not at the same time. And there's been some restitching at the top here, which is not really common. You don't see this type of sewing. But again, the purpose here is to make this book last. He would have had recited this probably every morning. And then we go here where we compare it now with a, another Psalter, bigger Psalter. We have the leather here to protect it. And we have what's called an end band here, which is really not common. They don't survive that much. And what we see here is to originally the leather covering would have covered the entire books, but due to insect bite, termites bite, termites, as you can see here, they've taken the initiative to cut the leather binding and further protect the book. Usually the priest would also burn the incense, not directly towards the book, but obviously the book would be exposed to the smell. I have seen an example where Certain manuscripts are opened 
to get uh, the smell of the incense and that's to get you know uh, because it is written on fresh skin and you can sometimes smell the goat or the skin smell which is not pleasant and again from the smell of this book we can sense that this book would have probably been kept uh, in a monastery there's been a lot of traditional folk men here Modern conservation is really non-interferal, so they do not interfere with the bindings. The per, the, their main objective is to maintain the book. Every bit, every change that we see here, everything added, things ripped, we have the board ripped here, it tells a story. So to re-bind it or to remake it again would be, we lose this history. And now we move on to something which is really an example of a personal devotional book. It's held in this case, which is called a Mahadar. And so the Mahadar again has an important function, which is to protect the book further. But sometimes the Mahadar itself is, is, is symbolically referred to as the womb of Mary. Whereas when you're opening it, you are also bringing out Christ. So sometimes the Mahadar is likened um, to Mary. Again, this shows really the love and reverence that Ethiopians have for uh, the sacred books. You would not leave the Mahadar lying around open like this, because again, it is the symbol of the Virgin's womb. The pious person or the believer would respectfully close it. This book is, is so important that the owner has not only covered it with leather, as you can see inside, you can just see the leather outside here, but he's also covered it in this beautiful textile. And the way one would open this is to unwrap it like this. Again, this also protects, protects the edges of the book and the opening. This kind of books, personal book and Psalters, are read outside. And this is to actually get the book to be exposed a little bit to the air and also in the light, in the natural light. The owner is also able to examine if there are any damages. It is a way of further preserving the manuscript. And again, here we have a very good example of, of care because it was kept in the case. The manuscript looks good as new. So what we have here um, is referred to as magic scrolls, amulet scrolls, healing scrolls. Scrolls uh, particularly were made for um, various against various illnesses and, and diseases or uh, witchcraft. So the purpose of scroll is protection. So they're usually kept in a case and they're seldom displayed or opened. And so they're carried around. So they're very durable. They're used a lot. The person who the scroll was made for would have worn it, certainly and would have carried it around. They're never displayed and they're, they're displayed in cases of where a person is ill. Most young Ethiopians are not aware of this tradition. It's important as an Ethiopian for me is, is part of my identity. Understanding the, with the tradition where I come from, for me that's really significant. Making them accessible to people will you know, ensure others um, you know, who might not be familiar uh, to learn more about it and to just to continue this tradition. By respecting that tradition, you're respecting a great achievement here, one of the greatest inventions the creation of the book.